Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Canadian Professional Sales Association. Please note that everyone is on mute and you will be able to ask questions at the end of the session using the Q&A function. We'll try our best to answer all questions within our allotted time. Today's webinar will focus on five steps to kickstart your sales career and it will be hosted by Sales for Life CEO, Jamie Shane. Jamie is one of the world's leading social selling experts. He has personally built social selling solutions in nearly every industry, ranging from startups to Fortune 500 corporations, such as Intel, SAS, IBM, Oracle, Thomson Reuters, and Sprint. Jamie is the author of the book Social Selling Mastery, which is being released in September 2016, and he's delivered keynotes in dozens of cities across six continents. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jamie to start. Fantastic, everybody. The goal of this webinar is really simple. I've been selling for 20 years. I've lucked my way into the sales community, but I want to help you who's thinking about or has just recently joined the sales community understand how you scale, understand how you grow and be part of this community because there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths. I want to debunk those on the call today. The first one and the most popular myth and also anyone that ever wants to become an entrepreneur. Do not think an MBA is the path to becoming a sales professional. That is just not true. Any degree, any diploma can allow you to be a sales professional. Do not let education be the hindrance to you kickstarting that sales career. And I can say this firsthand. I have a master's degree. I did my MBA at the University of South Australia in Adelaide, Australia. And MBAs are meant to be the management of people and the process of those people. It has nothing to do with selling. There wasn't a sales course even within my MBA, let alone my undergrad in commerce. Selling is about learning on the job, learning from your peers, learning through video, learning through action. It's not going to be taught in an MBA class. We go to the next slide. I want to see, I want to show you kind of five steps that we're going to go through. And step number one is you have to get in the door. You have to get in the door no matter what. You see, when I was working at the bank, I didn't get the job because I had great grades from my commerce degree. In fact, I was a terrible student. I got into the bank because I volunteered there two days a week because I wanted to be a stockbroker. If you need to volunteer in the demand generation role, in a sales support role, do it. Beg, borrow, and steal. Get yourself in the door and learn. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to tell you how I got into actual sales. I had come back from Australia from my MBA. It's the beginning of 2014, and for 10 months, I couldn't find a job. I didn't want a sales job. I, my whole life, wanted to be a stockbroker. And then I discovered, as I became a stockbroker, that it's actually a sales job. I didn't know this. I watched the stock market crumble in 2000 and 2001, and I was very disenfranchised with the industry, disenchanted with the industry. But now it's 2004, I can't find a job, and there's one company that keeps interviewing me, but they're reluctant to hire me because I don't have traditional sales experience. And that was Cressa Partners. And so they're downtown Toronto. Uh, they were at the time King and Young Street. Now they're at, uh, I believe, King and University. And so I decided I need a job so bad, I can't pay the rent, I can't live. I put on a suit, I went to their front door, I waited until the receptionist left her post, I snuck into the office, ran down the hallway, opened the office door to the CEO's office. And when I ran in the room to try to kind of hide behind the door so I could talk to the CEO, he was coming out of the room at the same time with a squash bag in his hand. He was leaving to go to the Cambridge Club to play squash at lunch. He said, fine, follow me to the Cambridge Club, talk to me about why you want this job. I begged, borrowed, and stealed for the next 10 minutes, walking down King Street, convincing him that I could take a junior role, that I could hit the phones, I could do whatever it takes to get that job. Sales people hire people that remind them of themselves, that they feel emulate themselves. So take that to heart. Now, uh, going to the next step, in step number two, if you're going to choose a sales role, you, you have the opportunity to come into, uh, into a sales organization and a variety of different roles. You were to think about what's going to build you the best track to financial success and career trajectory, no question, 
take the lead generation role, in my opinion, over customer success, over channel sales, over even field sales. Yes, even field sales. You might upfront say, but I'm going to get paid more to be in the field. I get to learn to close. Long term, if you do not learn to generate your own leads, you will not be a sustainable sales professional. I'm a huge believer. Learn the, learn the, the business development and lead generation first and it allows you to explore into all the other elements of selling, field sales, sales uh, engineering, uh, customer success, channel sales, all of it could be your oyster because you have the baseline and fundamental knowledge on how to generate your own leads. This is the single biggest problem that sales professionals uh, find and, and if you can learn the core basics, you're going to set yourself up. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you'll be able to rely on those skills. But I constantly see sales professionals that go into roles that do not have a lead generation. They're in an account management role and they never learn the, the art of lead generation. And when they want to switch out of account management, which typically those that can find deals and win deals in enterprise sales make the most money, Account, account, uh, account directors or account managers who are accustomed to kind of servicing an account typically can't make that adjustment. So if you have a choice, take a pay cut, learn lead generation because you will 10x your growth within 10 years beyond anyone that does account management. Step number three. Step number three is turn your brain into a sponge. I know you've heard this, but the reality in today's sales world, when I learned selling, uh, I was 25 years old, I'm in corporate real estate, and I worked in a bullpen, 50 sales professionals all on one floor. And I would hear conversations on the phone, and I would, as a sales professional would walk up to the water cooler, I would pretend I need to go there too, I'd walk up, I'd ask them questions, I'd pick their brains. The water cooler effect was how 10, 15 years ago, sales professionals learned. The reality is most sales professionals are in a virtual environment now. So you are forced to learn through your internal learning portals, learning management systems, videos, peer-to-peer -peer chats, social media. You need to be a sponge on your own because you will not learn it through osmosis in many sales organizations like you used to. If you go to the next slide, one of my the tips that I recommend uh, even though I wrote a book, read, 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 I'm also a listener. I found out there's, there's kind of basically three ways that people learn. You, you're either visual, you're auditory, or you're uh, calisthenic or kinetic or whatever, whatever it is, the, the touch. I, I can't think of the word right now. Long and the short, I discovered my retention comes through my hearing. So for me, last year I listened to 30 sales books, 30. I have a commute every day on the way in, on the way out, uh, when I'm at the airport, when I'm on a train, I'm listening to sales books. Become an encyclopedia of sales best practices. You can learn so much by picking up these books and listening to them. Unfortunately, mine's not there yet, uh, so you may actually have to read it with your eyes, but there are so many great sales books that you can listen to and accelerate your career. Going to the next. Step number four, now you're in market. You're at an organization, you're starting to generate leads, perhaps you're even working deals. And when I say deals, it's whatever part of the sales cycle that you're working. If your job is to create sales accepted leads so that an account executive can qualify them, so be it, let's call that a one deal. That's, that's a deal for you. Do anything you can to win deals. Do anything you can to get volume in, in the door. This is another failure for sales professionals. Um, again, I'll, I'll pick on the account managers. Account managers, they'll work one account for the first eight years of their life. They'll work the Home Depot account or the Diageo account or you know the Canadian Tire account. Not only do they not learn what I believe is a fundamental skill around lead generation, they don't get enough touch points. They don't get enough at-bats. And because of that, they don't know what it's like to get hungry. 
to, to have a quota on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis that has them doing volume after volume of deals. If I were to ask you, if you had a choice between selling one ERP solution, a multi-million dollar deal right now as your kind of your first sales job versus getting in a SaaS software company where you can do 10 deals a month, get in that SaaS software company. Get in more conversations, get in more objections, more at bats, do anything you can to win deals or bring in leads because again, 10 years from now, your, your skill set will demolish those that have done kind of one account, five account, account management. And if you go to the next uh, line, uh, if you go to the next slide, you know, I have a great story around doing anything it takes to win a deal. Um, when I was in corporate real estate, I had maybe had a couple deals under my belt, and we won uh, an RFP, or it's called a mandate, for one of the largest uh, industrial deals we would have done that year. So we're working the deal, it's myself and the CEO, that's how big this deal was, and I, you know, I had stars in my eyes. All I could think about was, oh my God, I'm going to pay off my MBA debt, I'm going to be able to buy a house, this is incredible. And the customer of ours, and they were looking for a parcel of land in the Milton area. And so on a Saturday morning, we with the customer had to go look at this parcel of land with this existing landlord. Saturday morning, 8 a.m., it's cold, and the customer and the landlord get in a physical fight on the land. And after this all gets broken up, the customer pulls me into his Audi A8, A8L, and in the back seat, turns to me Trump style and says, you're fired. You're fired because you didn't understand how to, you know, what kind of landlord we were dealing with. You didn't understand how to build this deal out properly. So I go home, I'm in tears, oh my God, my world's crumbling, my six-figure deal has fallen apart. And my roommate at the time says, buck up, do something to get that deal back. So I went to the liquor store, I bought a $150 bottles of, bottle of scotch, drove to the gated community called King City, jumped the fence of the gated community, walked down the road with this really expensive bottle of, of scotch, and the CEO of the company that we had been dealing with was sitting on his porch in his bathrobe smoking a cigar on a Saturday morning. He laughed at me as he saw me walking down the driveway, which was about five miles long. We sat in his backyard, had a scotch, rekindled, and brought the deal back to life. And it was thinking outside of the box, doing whatever you can to get more at-bats, more experience than anybody else. Do more deals. Even if you have to do crummy deals, just get experience. And then my tip number five, as you're growing your sales career, is education. Now this might seem biased from a training organization, but I can't stress to you that in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, companies invested a tremendous amount of time, money, and energy on training their sales professionals. If you go to work at a small to medium organization, they just don't have the budget or the manpower or the resources to do this. It's expected that you self-educate. And they're going to cut you a leash that's about yay long. If you have to pay for it, do it. Learning doesn't end after you've finished university or finished your master's degree. You are constantly learning. I had to learn all the basic sales methodologies. I had to learn all complex selling versus value-based selling, versus strategic selling. I had to learn it all, and I'm still learning every day, including social and digital selling. Why? Because it's constantly evolving. Educate yourself. You're part of the CPSA. Do a course. Do multiple courses. It, an investment in yourself of a couple hundred dollars, and you win a $50,000 deal six months from now because of it, it's the easiest return on investment you could ever imagine. So as we kind of wrap everything up, going to the next slide, I hope that some of this information is sinking in because I'll give you a real customer success story. CA Technologies, uh, we trained 3,000 of their sales professionals. And we had a theory with the customer that those that are willing to learn are most likely to change the behavior, are most likely to have the greatest results. 
So what they did is they looked at all of their sales professionals that did our social selling mastery course. And those that completed the course outperformed those that gave up halfway, because there's those that quit, by 35% a year. So I want you to think of what that could mean. In commission dollars, you're literally talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in a sales professional's pocket extra. In six, This is over a six month period. Because all they did is they took a little bit of time to self-educate and apply what they learned. And if you compound that, you're going to far exceed your peers. And it's those sales professionals that become team leaders. Many of our sales professionals, we've trained 65 to 75,000 sales professionals. They then became directors and vice presidents of business divisions because they learned how to generate leads, how to scale through social and digital, teach it to their own peers, self-educate. And uh, now, I, you know, one of the things we could do now as we come to the last slide is if there are any questions, uh, perhaps we can take the mic off or if you want to put it in the chat box, what, what do you think is the best way, uh, team, and they can maybe put questions in the chat box, I'm happy to answer them. Yep, I think that uh, the Q&A box would be the best function to use. Um, we're going to open up the floor to any questions, so please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll forward them over to Jamie to address live. And do you want to read them out to me, or will I be able to see the uh, questions? I think I might be able to see them if they come. Don't be shy. Ask me any question. I, I am a very transparent person. I'll tell it like it is. I think we have some quiet kitties today. Okay, oh, the question is, what is the best way to reach out to a top prospect at a C-level, key decision maker? Cold outreach. So the easiest way to describe this is what is known as the sphere of influence. So I'm going to use a, a, an image to describe this. I want you to, be, I want you to picture this C-level executive sitting on this business card. The sphere of influence, one of the challenges, one of the problems that sales professionals face is they'll then try to reach out to that sales professional or that, uh, that C-level and say, we've done business with Harley Davidson, American Airlines, and Tim Hortons. It means nothing to that C-level executive unless it's within their sphere of influence. So that C-level executive, me, C-level executive, what's in my sphere of influence? People that used to work at Sales for Life or that person's company, current employees, vendors, partners, competitors, People that went to their university, university alumni, friends, family. What If you want to reach out to a C-level executive, and we do it, it's called account-based sales development strategy. You develop a cadence of, a, you draw a map on a sheet of paper of everything and everyone that is within their sphere of influence. Competitors, people that used to work there that you've done business with, people that work there that you know. You have to relate to that person within that sphere of influence. And you leverage, whether it's great insights, referral, or connections within, or triggers, job changes that have happened, mergers and acquisitions data, uh, 10K filing information if you're dealing in a, with American corporations. The only way that it works to get in cold, you need to think of the person you're talking to in their sphere of influence, and then you start applying the platforms and the mediums that make sense to communicate with them. So if you look at our cadence, our account-based sales development cadence, those touch points could be up to 10 touch points in a month, and they are social, whether it's Twitter and, and LinkedIn, there is physical mailers, there are calls, but these calls are not cold, these are, these are warm. We've, you know, you you have contextual conversations with these people, so I, I you know, Robert, I hope that that um, uh, that helped a little bit. I recognize that we only have a short window. I want to answer some of the other questions. Uh, some of the other questions here: uh, How do you recommend we find leads as a mortgage agent? You know, interesting. I um, 
I don't know that space very well, but as a mortgage agent, uh, one of the things, you know, I think about it, I think about my own life with my wife. We're on Instagram and Facebook, and we're constantly uh, sharing ourselves socially. Um, and so one of the things you could think about is leveraging people's Facebook and Instagram that are growing their families. I'm just thinking aloud, right? Uh, constantly sharing the news of growing their families, new successes, um, uh, people who are uh, taking new expanded roles within businesses. These are triggers. Uh, you know, this is a trigger if you owned a, a minivan company, right? You're looking for people growing, uh, growing their families. One thing that you could look for socially are those that are expanding uh, their families. And there's all kinds of that, you know, Facebook material or Instagram material on this uh, that might be able to help you. What are your top three sales strategy books? The book uh, for me that, that kick-started everything, when I read The Challenger Sale, changed my life. 2011, 2012, read The Challenger Sale. I, you know, we started Sales for Life based on many of the principles uh, in that book. Uh, from a sales strategy standpoint, um, oh my, I, I, you know, ping me, uh, my email uh, is jamie at salesforlife.com. I'll take screenshots of my audibles of all the sales books that I've read, and I'm happy to send it to people. So jamie at salesforlife.com, just ping me. I'll send you my audibles. I, there's just so many sales books. Uh, what if you're in an account management role? handling a small, a small number of large VIP customers or accounts trying to win work. What learnings would you focus on? So you're an account management role, you, your, your account base is small, but they are enterprise or majors accounts to your organization. What learnings would you focus in on? Uh, it, for an account management strategy, what I would recommend is absolutely socially surround that account and do not become single threaded. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen in 20 years is you'll have been assigned accounts and you'll have relationship managers that you deal with at these accounts. Many times are just champions and influencers but not decision makers. And they represent a business unit that is not all of the business units, let alone the C-level executives. Start forming relationships with leaders within other business units, other verticals, other departments, uh, so that if a person leaves your particular post at that company, uh, you're not what's called single-threaded. You're not left holding the bag. Read the book called The Challenger Customer. It says that in any majors or enterprise account, there are 6.8 decision makers, champions, and influencers that make up a buying committee. The people that you deal with one-on-one -on -one every day are not the only people that make decisions. And so you need to get to know so many more people in the organization than you think because the average North American is only keeping their job for 2.5 years. So the transitions in and out of those accounts can be so rapid. You just don't want to be left uh, missing a quarter because you have to turn to your manager and say, oh, Susie's left and I, ha I have to restart developing relationships at our majors account, so you want to avoid that. Um, another question, uh, I find it, uh, I have a hard time getting directly to financial advisors to sell financial products. I always get their advisors blocking the door. What do you suggest? Should I be honest and advise? Uh, I am looking to share information on our fund. Okay. So you're selling into the Scotia McClouds, the BMO Nesbitt Burns, the TD Evergreens, and it's the brokers uh, that think they know everything. One of the th one of the things that you may and I, I I haven't been in this space in a long time, but may consider is education through content. Uh, you know, actually, I'm just thinking aloud here. One of the things that I think is missing from the financial services industry is great insights and content, video, infographics, blogs, stories, uh, digital stories um, that you can then share with the brokers um, and even track what they're looking at so that it gives you a sense of which brokers are mildly interested in having those conversations. I think that brokers, because financial advisors themselves are sales professionals, 
they're so busy worrying about their own customers, uh, worrying about servicing them or finding net new customers, that um, what I learned about that space when I was in that role is that they are less the stock picker, less the true financial advisor, more the sales professional than a lot of people realize. And so they, like sales professionals, are worried about their own quota. So if you can educate them and nurture them behind the scenes, um, I think that when they have some downtime and they're thinking about readjusting their portfolios or learning about net new things, um, your insights might trigger some ideas for them rather than, you know, hi, I'm calling, I'm doing a broker lunch, I'm coming into your office, so I bought you lunch and I'm going to show you about my fund. I think there's a lot of people already doing that. And so if you can come at this from a, dig from a digital content marketing perspective and educate them behind the scenes, I don't know, but I'm guessing that I don't see a lot of that in the space. Um, and how are we doing for time? Do you want me to answer any more? Or? I think we're doing okay. Jamie, if you want to take a couple more, um, we've got a few okay. more questions. Yeah. Um, um, let's see here. How important is one elevator pitch? Uh, and when best to use it versus talking to a client about their business and asking questions about them. The, the elevator pitch is really important for the one second that a C-level executive wants you just to be blunt and honest and ask, what do you do? Like, why are you here? That's going to happen. And being able to succinctly tell somebody what you do and the value you offer in one to two sentences is really, really hard. Really hard. And one way to practice this, go onto your LinkedIn profile and start trying to redo your headline. So take your headline, you've got your photo in your headline. Don't have it say account manager at so-and-so. Put your value proposition in that headline in 130, 140, or 150 characters. If you can practice putting your value proposition there, you'll, you'll learn your elevator pitch. But rarely am I asked the elevator pitch unless somebody asks, what do you do? Most important is about being able to have contextual conversations. And this is the important piece. I'm a believer that the days of probing, of just asking question after question, are done. It's about being able to have a conversation where the person on the other end feels and almost asks themselves, did you have my job or have you worked in my industry before? Because you really seem to understand my industry. So. Uh, to answer your question, when you asked versus talking to clients about their business and asking questions about them, if you sell to CFOs, learn about the vernacular and the way they measure themselves and the way they think. So that when you're talking to a CFO, they think you were a previous accountant. If you're selling to me as a CEO, learn entrepreneurial jargon. Learn what it's like for me to think about working capital, cash flow, all the challenges of hiring and firing and all the things that entrepreneurs sweat about, if you can talk to me and relate to me about entrepreneurship, you have my ear. Um, and I'll answer one more question. Uh, Renee asks, what is the top character trait of a successful salesperson? If you ever watch one of our webinars, go into our resource library and there's a webinar by Mary Shea from Forrester and Mark Roberts, the Chief Revenue Officer at HubSpot. And HubSpot measured this over the thousand people or whatever sales professionals they hired. And it's not what you think. It's not negotiation skills. It's not presentation skills. Those are commodities. They are true commodities. The real value are people that are willing to learn and apply what they learn. Actually, what HubSpot found, people that are willing to be sponges and accept, I don't know all the answers, and I'm going to learn a new thing. So for HubSpot, they sold to digital marketers. They, one of the first things they do when they, uh, when they hire people is they have the sales professionals build a website and learn what it's like to be a digital marketer. So you, you gotta learn on the job, you gotta empathize with your customer, and then constantly you have to learn everything it's like to be a digital marketer. So my advice to the number one trait, and I look at the successful teammates we have, they didn't come, there, there was no such thing as social selling training before us, let alone none of them came from the training industry. They had to learn how to sell management consulting, how to sell training, how to talk to the largest 
to Xerox, to IBM, to Thomson Reuters, talk to these C-level executives in a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, that all comes with just being a sponge. So team, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I see there are a few more questions, but um, you know, gonna have to cut it short, unfortunately. You can always reach me at jamie at salesforlife.com. And, uh, and, and of course, if you wanna know more about social selling, we have a book on Amazon, and it's in Chapters Indigo, Social Selling Mastery. And uh, it'll give you, it is, it is meant to give you the playbook on social selling. Perfect, thank you so much, Jamie. So of course, on behalf of the CPSA, we'd like to thank Jamie and our audience for attending today's webinar. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact success at cpsa.com. And for those of you who'd like a video copy of this webinar, stay tuned and we'll have an email to you shortly. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, take care.